Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to react to 90 Day Fiancé. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As I always say, don't use YouTube as a replacement for therapy. If you need a therapist, get one. You deserve it. Let's get to the show. Hey, it's someone new. And he's dressed up like a king. And it looks like he is going to read a children's book to children. That's just a guess. Someone new on the show. That's fantastic. Let's see who this guy is. All right, guys. Who's ready for story time? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. oh, that's really nice of you. My name is Andrew. I'm from Roseville, California. I'm 32 years old, and I run a daycare center. All right, ready? Interesting. He runs a daycare center. So I grew up in a home where my mom had a daycare center and had kids of that age that she had, I don't know, 10 to 20 kids aged two to four, two to five in that range. And they were all running around in my house. We had a, we didn't have a huge house. They would take naps in my room, in my bed. I would come home from school, you know, you're a teenager and you just you throw off your bag and you just want to go in your room and brood like a angsty teenager would and my and I'd have my hand on the doorknob of my room and my mom would say no 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 there's there's kids in there they're they're napping on your bed <laughs> it happened all the time I'd just be like <laughs> but the kids were really cute and a lot of what I learned about psychology and development I learned through osmosis just watching my mom at a daycare just watching her deal with the kids, watching the parents and the kids together when they dropped the kids off. I, of course, didn't care. I was uh, age probably eight-ish to I moved out at 18. So for a majority of my childhood, I was intimately watching, uh, whether I wanted to or not, my mother as she was a very excellent daycare center person. She was one of those daycare people who knew every child very, very well, knew the families, was very, very good with kids. Kids would come in with behavioral problems, and she would very deftly figure out how to help them integrate into the group, how to help them with their emotions. And she's also a very, very expressive person and very positive <laughs> <laughs> we'll be, my mom, we'll be walking around in public. She'll see someone that has a an interesting coat on and she'll just walk up to him and say like, I love your coat. And people love her. Whenever people meet my parents, they love both of them. Uh, but particularly my mom, my dad's very nice too, but my mom is just like over the top, a, a good person, forgiving, loving, nice person. It really showed when she would have 15 kids. So that's great. So Andrew uh, runs a daycare. That's interesting. I, I, I'm glad that we're seeing it. Also, I, I'm glad that we're breaking a gender norm here. A lot of times, one, men don't feel like it's a manly job, so they will avoid it. Two, a lot of times we will look at men like this and say, oh, he must be a predator, which needs to stop. <laughs> it is awful. As a man myself, who is not a predator, I have been the victim of this. Early on in my career, before I was a therapist, I would work with kids. And sometimes uh, my job uh, entailed me taking a kid on an outing, we called it, where I'd take him to the zoo, and it was just me, and I'm 24 years old. I just look like a college guy, I guess. And I'm taking the kid to the pool, I'm taking the kid to the, to the zoo. And because I'm Asian, I wouldn't look like the kid, because usually the kid wasn't Asian. And I would get some funny looks, man. People would look at me like, what is that guy doing with that kid? What's going on there? And it, who knows, maybe I was paranoid, but I don't think it's a stretch to believe that people were thinking that I was a predator or something Something was wrong with me or something. And I'm not going to lie, it bothered me. I pushed past it. I, I didn't let it get to me. But anyway, so I, I really like this thus far. Now, maybe Andrew is a terrible human being. <laughs> You just never know. But uh, I hope he's not. At least in this moment, we don't have any evidence to believe he's a terrible person. And we're seeing a man have a daycare. And we can all just accept that, that that's okay, 
that he's probably not a predator, <laughs> okay? That of the people, you know, the percentage of people who are predators are very, very small. And so the likelihood that he is an abusive person is very, very small. It doesn't mean that we don't look for it and make sure and do background checks. But anyway, the point is, is that I'm glad that he is breaking the stereotype so we can all get used to seeing men in the role of caregiving for children for a lot of reasons. Anyway, let's continue watching. I got you a present for your, uh, for your baby shower. The one you're not going to be at. I really am sorry. I really want to be there. Connie's uh, not too happy that I'm going to miss her baby shower. But I don't think that Connie experiences the gravity of what's at stake here. I'm just going to say this. It's a pet peeve of mine when I'm talking to people and they have mirror shades on. It, it really bothers me. <laughs> it rarely, rarely happens. But when it does, like, I'll just stop. the guy. I'll be like, can you take off your sunglasses? Because it's actually a pet peeve of mine when people talk to me with sunglasses. They're in the shade, so he doesn't have to have them on. And I don't know, maybe he has some kind of eye condition that where he needs to have sunglasses on all the time. But to talk to someone like that, you you can't see their eyes. So it's really hard to have a conversation. You don't know where they're looking. I don't know about you, but it just really makes it hard. It's like talking to someone when you can when you hear an echo, you know, when you're on your cell phone and you hear an echo and how much that drives you nuts. That's what it's like when I, does it drive you nuts? Let me know in the comments. You Is know. that like a deal breaker for you though? Cause I know you want to have kids. Like you want to start having kids like right now. That would be such a difficult choice for me. Yeah. I do love her. Do you think she'll change her mind about kids? She's changing it now. That's the problem. So my brother really wants kids. I remember a couple. Interesting. So he's saying that he wants to have kids and now she is saying, Amira is saying, she doesn't want to have kids. You know, it's a tough situation. What do you do? You're in love, and it's hard to, f he's talked about, I didn't show the clip, but he's tried to date people in his in his town, and it never worked out, and he thinks he's found his, his soulmate. And that's a real tough choice of, do I give up on true love? Maybe I'll never find it again. Or do I you know, move forward with this relationship and give up on my dreams of having children. You know, that's, that's a really tough choice to make. I will tell you, just, uh, I'm getting a, like a slight cult vibe from him. Now, I haven't seen much at all from him, so who knows? And I have a hard time imagining that that's what's going to happen. But the way he talks, there's just something, I don't know about you, but, and I love this because y'all haven't watched, you, you know, this is, I'm watching this as these episodes are coming out. So we're all in this situation together, but, but let me know in the comments if you're getting a little bit of a cult vibe from him. And maybe it's like the good side of cult and, and not the bad side. Anyway, let's continue watching. I think I'll have that conversation. And if she decides that she doesn't want to have kids, you're still going to go through with it? I, I, I really hope that this, there's, there's common ground here. Since you're going to have 14 days in Mexico, basically, no interruptions. It's just going to be the two of you. I would just recommend, like, you guys really talk about these topics. Talk. Yes, yes, a thousand yeses. <laughs> the sister has a, a lot of wisdom here. And we see this happening at times, and I will often comment on it, of if you have a deal breaker, then you got to work that out in advance. And I, of course, the reason why people avoid it is they don't want to lose their dreams and they will delude themselves into thinking, well, I'll change her mind or I'll change, I'll make him religious or I'll, she'll, she'll want to have kids. She'll, she'll change her mind later. And that is just not right headed thinking. And it sucks to have to consider breaking up with someone even though you're in love and you like them, and but you have this one life difference. But it is a major life difference, whether or not to have kids. I know couples who have been together in the past, in my personal life and in professionally, who are together for years, absolutely knowing that they had one of those major differences. And they were always trying to navigate it. Well, what... What if I could live without kids? You know, maybe I'll try that on, or you know, maybe I'll convince her, and you know, she'll. And in the end, it just never worked out because those things are fundamental, and to a lot of us. And I mean, sometimes you can change your mind and, and you can adjust, but for 
at the very least, you really need to wrestle with it as an, as a person. You really need to figure out, okay, like for him, okay, am I, am I willing to let go of my dream of having kids? Is that actually an option? I would say that I might be able to change your mind, but what if I can't change your mind? Am I willing to live a life without ever having children? How does that feel to me? Because if it's somewhat okay, maybe he says, well, when I work out all the pros and the cons, it's not ideal, but I'd rather be with her and not have kids than not be with her. So, so for him, he would have to figure that out. For her, she would also have to figure that out. For the two of them, they have to figure that out as well. Of like, well, how flexible are you on this? And I know you feel this way now, but might you change your mind in the future? I'm not pressuring you now, but and don't tell me what I want to hear by you know never just tell me what I want to hear because I want to know the truth about the matter. And so you know figuring that out amongst themselves. And so the sister is spot on, and. You just see that look in his eye of like, oh, I don't want to have that conversation. That's not going to be comfortable for me. But it is so important. We've seen the fallout from these couples not having those conversations up front. Talk about the having kids. Talk about what your plan is. Don't get lost in the lovey-dovey, nice to see you, I love you, honeymoon phase. And just focus on talking about some of those bigger topics because you are about to get married. And before you marry anybody, you want to make sure that you guys are on the same page. It's all really complicated. It needs to be figured out. So his response doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. He just said, yeah, it's just, it's all very complicated. Um, I guess, but in another way, it's not complicated at all. She doesn't want to have kids. You do want to have kids. The two of you have to figure out how flexible either you, either of you are on that issue and whether or not it's a deal breaker for for either one of you, mainly for him, because you can't force her to have kids, of course, right? So her will will be imposed on him by the nature of the disagree, of the of the decision to have kids, and so for him, he has to decide. It's not complicated. It's very kind of simple, really. Do I want to be with someone that doesn't want to have kids? Am I willing to live a life without ever having kids again for the rest of my life? It's a, you know, it's a hard question to answer, but it's not a complicated question. So his response makes me wonder if he's thinking, well, I just want to avoid it right now. It's, it's complicated. You know, let's just not talk about it. I don't know. Andrew would keep asking to do what he wants until I give up. Until I give up and say, yes, okay, I do it. It's still in lockdown over there. But he gave me an ultimatum. He said that if I don't do the, the trip, He's going to resent me forever. Yikes. <sighs> what? So the way that Andrew was painting it, the two of them both wanted to go to Mexico to meet up. But from her perspective, she feels completely pressured into doing it and that he gave her an ultimatum. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is not love. I feel very worried if she traveled to Mexico because might be she catch corona there, might be she have trouble with the immigration. It's not Amira, Andrew who pushing her. Yeah, I mean, there's another option that Andrew wasn't pressuring her and she just felt pressured. But I don't know, her story sounded believable, so that's just not a good sign. A lot of money between us, so I have to do things for him. Yikes. What? Yikes. Oh. He seemed like a nice guy at first, and then he started giving me some cult vibes, which was scary. And now she's saying she's being pressured and that he gives he gave her an ultimatum. And now she's saying that he gives her money, so I have to do things for him. Uh. <laughs> so this is the first episode where we've seen these two. And already it's like, just no, just stop. I, I didn't like uh, how he act with you. Every time he make you cry. I don't like him at all. 
and he's saying every time you interact with him, he makes you cry. Like, oh boy, yikes. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, do so now. Go to patreon.com and become a patron of our podcast. That shows us that you like what we're doing. And I get an email every time that someone becomes a patron, and it just warms my heart. It really, really does. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.